These are sort of odd shaped buildings. So these are some of the products. Cannons for the Continental Navy. And these are pig iron. Another big wagon. The cast house. The intermittent roar of the force blast could be heard a long distance away. From the top of the furnace stack, a steam of sparks was occasionally emitted as the flames rose and fell. Look at this. That thing is huge. Big block and tackle. Pulleys. So air would be forced into the furnace. Via this pipe perhaps. And what might this be right here? Casting table, that's what it was. They are making parts for the stoves. Let's go over here and look at this inventory. Big iron production. Molten iron flowed from the furnace's tap hole. Okay, there they are. Those are those slots. I was standing on them. The cast iron forms became known as pigs since they outlined the resembling resemble a sow nursing a litter. Once cool, pig iron was sold to forges and foundries for further processing. During the furnace's last 40 years of operation, ending in 1883, Hopewell mainly produced rough iron bars. Prior to this period, Hopewell profited from the sale of finished products, stove plates, hollowware, weights, and other molded items. And here's an example of those. This must be like a, I don't know, door? Top, plates, etc. But this is some of the irons they used to hold the mold that had the hot iron in it. Yep, these are made of wood. Look at this thing, this is huge. Water wheel. This water wheel powered Hopewell's blast machinery. How did that work? The two blowing tubs would continuously force air into the furnace to intensify its heat. By 1822, 
Blowing tubs replace bellows. Piston rods attached to each end of the water wheel shaft move pistons in and, in and outside the tubs of compressed air. The air forced into equalizing box between the tubs was directed through a blast furnace. And here it is right here. You see that piston rod going up and down. Everything was wood and steel. Or like that wood and iron. Wow, this thing is huge. How much charcoal did it consume per day? It had to be a, a large amount. Let's see what's in this room right here. Probably more casting. And these look like these were used, oh, these were casting molds. Look at that stove. And he's trimming some wood there. This is an iron plate, I guess you said, on the top of the stove. And these were, I don't know what these were. Good advice. All right, let's continue the tour of the furnace. Here we go. The art of flask, flask casting, making a stove plate, sand over a wooden pattern in the bottom of it, called a drag. Next, he filled the box with unsifted sand and packed it with a rammer. Excess sand was cleared away from the box. Loose sand was blown off with the bellows. Molds attached to the cape or top of the flask to the drag, a wooden wedge or gate was inserted to form a hole and allow entry of the molded iron and sand was rammed around it. And there it is. The two halves of the box were clamped together to prevent liquid metal from lifting the cope. And there he is pouring the molding iron into these boxes, these molds. And these are hooks. I suppose we're using the manufacturing process. Look at this. It's quite heavy. Look at this, it's made out of logs. And a shake roof, cedar shake roof. More moles, I guess. And I don't know what these are, but apparently these are used for demonstrations on occasion. I 
Yeah, let's go back here and there's a stream flowing down here. The exit stream. There's that piston going up and down, operating that pressure pipe. That's a nice sound, isn't it? It's kind of a steady, gentle mechanical and water noise. And look, there's some good use of the iron they have. These are braces to keep the walls from billowing out. And this is the uh, race. Let's go up and take a look at it. Coming from a diverted stream. Another sycamore tree. Sycamore trees love the water. Here's a sluice gate. Water being harnessed and put to work. And this is a stream or a spring, probably a stream. This is quite a complex. All requiring heavy manual labor. Once again, the structure of the foundry, barns, shops, stone foundation. Took a lot of rock gathering. I don't know how much cutting and shaping they did of the rocks. Probably had to do some. And that's a cantilevered barn. Is that what that's called? I can't remember. The top part it sticks out. So this is the charcoal house. And they would also bring the uh, limestone and other products up here. They'd bring it from this building along here to the top of the furnace. I guess in these carts here. and dump it in right here. Head races. Iron ore, limestone, charcoal. Workers known as fillers came here to load iron ore, charcoal, and limestone into carts. They pushed the material through the open-sided connecting shed to the far end of the bridge house, directed by the furnace founder. So this wasn't the charcoal shed, this, well, yes it is. 
charcoal, limestone, etc. So there they are dumping it into the furnace. Hopewell's furnace consumed an average of 15 bushels of charcoal, 4,500 pounds of iron ore, and 3 to 4 pounds of limestone, 30 to 40, every half hour. And mind you, this thing was going 24-7. So it was always working, which required a lot of labor force. Because of this place here, the American Continental Congress was able to become independent from the British system because they had a homegrown industry to make iron products. All kinds of little trails in here. I'll have to come back. Well, wait a minute, I'll do this right now. rather than in the morning. So you had Teamsters hauling stone, charcoal, etc. A cooling shed. Teamsters drove wagon loads of hot newly made charcoal into this cooling shed, paid by the load delivered. Workers dumped charcoal here by removing wagon floorboards. Once charcoal cooled, it was moved and piled in the stone storage house in front of you and later used as furnace fuel. Occasionally charcoal caught fire to salvage parts of this load. A teamster pulled the wagon floorboards dropping charcoal to the ground. During an uncontrollable fire a teamster hit his wagon straight for a stream. There you go, the floorboard. The teamster and his team moved across rutted roadways, hauling up to 300 bushels of charcoal. Newly made charcoal cooled for days. A collier raked over a pile of fresh charcoal to keep it from reigniting. There's a wagon full of charcoal right there. See it? That's a lot. Okay, let's go up here and take a look. Maybe this is where they made the charcoal up here. Yeah, that makes sense, it would be close by. Look at that, anthracite furnace, a new iron making method. In 1853, the Hopewell partners built a hot blast anthracite furnace here. This new furnace did not burn charcoal, but used anthracite coal to smelt iron, an attempt to reduce costs and increase iron production. Hopewell's anthracite furnace operated for less than four years. By 1857, furnace machinery had been removed, installed in a new furnace on the Schuylkill Canal. Lots of stone, cut stone and loose stone assembled. And what were these? Maybe where they stored it at? Charcoal kills, that's what they are. In the mid-1800s, brick ovens of, or kills were built here in an attempt to modernize the charcoal process, believed to be economically beneficial. These kills fired and produced charcoal, but, but proved unsuccessful. It would re require an acre 
of wood uh, per day to run that furnace. That is, make charcoal to run the furnace. Charcoal pit. Look at this guy here, the last collier. Hopewell's last collier. Lafayette Ook steps out of a collier's hut built in the forest. That's where they lived. To begin making charcoal, the collier prepared a hearth by leveling the earth of the earth. In the hearth center, he drove a long pole or flagon to the, into the ground, then built a three corner chimney of small cuts of wood called lap wood. He slacked larger pieces of cordwood or billets against the chimney. It's getting bigger. Next lap wood was laid on the hearth to fill the air spaces. The collier covered the entire pit with layers of leaves and charcoal dust. Then lit the pit at the chimney's top. They ignited the wood covered with leaves and dirt to begin making the charcoal. It took 10 days to two weeks for wood to come to foot or char completely. Around the clock, colliers kept a watchful eye on the smolting pit to prevent an open flame from igniting and ruining the charcoal. Hopewell's best charcoal was made by gradually charring chestnut, oak, and hickory wood. Master colliers and their helpers made charcoal during the spring, summer, and fall. Seldom seen here, they lived as nomads in primitive cone-shaped huts. There's one right there. By centralizing their home sites, two or three charcoal workers could attend up to nine charcoal fires at a time. And here's a replica of the little hut. Not very roomy, but you could stand up in there.